I met him about four years ago, in the summer before going into grade 11. I was 14 years old, and since I failed maths, I was given the choice of either retaking it in grade 11, or completing the course over the summer, remedial. I chose to go to summer school, and my class was three hours. At the end of the day, I would wait by the bus stop, which was right beside the school for what felt like half an hour. I saw different bus drivers when I first attended this particular school, but that changed once I met one who stood out to me. Not because of his looks, but rather because he would always try to talk to me. I'm gonna refer to him as X, because I never knew his name. X appeared to be Jamaican, although I can't say for sure, and appeared to be in his late 30s, possibly early 40s. Keep in mind, I was 14 years old at the time, and he knew that because he asked. At first, it started out with him smiling at me, then it quickly turned into small talk. He would ask me questions about how school was, if I was doing okay, and stuff like that. After a little while, he then asked me to sit on the seat that was closest to him. Whenever I declined or sat somewhere further away, he would insist, and I gave in every time. And he would always talk to me and watch me in the rear view mirror while driving to the subway station, and was always happy to see me. I always started conversations and kept them going. If I can remember correctly, X would compliment me at times, saying that I looked pretty. At some point, he got even more weird. For instance, when I would be waiting at the bus stop, the bus eventually came, and I would avoid eye contact, and he wouldn't open the doors. And the second I looked at him, he would only then open the doors with a big smile on his face and greet me. I noticed this became a pattern, but I thought that maybe I was being paranoid or overthinking it. So over the next few days, I avoided eye contact and looked at the ground on my phone for maybe 10 to 15 seconds and he still wouldn't open the doors until I looked at him. I found that so weird, and my best friend at the time would not believe me about this bus driver. So one day I decided to show her what was happening, and she was pretty shocked. She told me to stay away from him, but I couldn't since the other bus would take so long to come, between 45 minutes to an hour. This continued for the rest of summer school and I hoped to never see him after my course was over. Of course, unfortunately, I ran into X while I was a little older, about 15. I was in the side of the subway that goes southbound, and there he was, now working as a train operator. At first, I didn't realize it was him, as I tend to forget faces. But the moment we locked eyes, he waved at me and smiled. Immediately, it came back to me. I knew who he was, and he started trying to talk to me. Hey, how are you? Haven't seen you in a while. I was rather awkward and said, I'm good, with a polite smile, and thankfully we went our separate ways. Even though our conversation was cut short, he made me feel uncomfortable, and still gave me creeper vibes. I ran into him once again a few months later. I was on the northbound side and the train had stopped and was out of service. There was a man, who was walking in the train to make sure no one was there. I forgot what X looked like, so I didn't recognize him at first, but I did once he saw me, and that huge grin plastered on his face. He mouthed, hey, since the doors were closed and I couldn't really hear him, nor he me. I waved and am very awkward and mouth high back. He asks, how am I? to which I reply I'm good, and then proceeds to ask me something which I couldn't make out. So naturally I looked confused. He grabbed his phone and mouthed, can I have your number? I said, no, sorry, please, he went, and does a praying hand gesture. I shook my head and then he smiled, thumbs up, waved goodbye and carried on walking to the train. I couldn't see him anymore and I thought that was the end, but I was wrong. He came back to where I was again, made a heart with his hands and then blew me a kiss and walked away. 
and returned two seconds later to blow me another one. I was pretty shaken up about it. I may not remember his face, but I will always recognize that smile and the way he goes, hey. So to the creepy bus driver and now train operator who asked an underaged girl for her number and blew her kisses on the subway, please realize you are incredibly inappropriate and let's never meet again. In college, I wait for my roommate to get off work at the new parking garage my campus built. He was a security guard on the night shift. Nothing too crazy most of the time, but one day he finished his shift and I told him I'd meet him outside. He leaves the garage and says, I don't think you're gonna believe me when I tell you this, but I have something to tell someone while it's fresh on my mind. The next part is how I remember him telling me while we sat in the car. He goes, I was sitting in the office, chatting it up with a custodian when he pointed to the security camera screen and told me there's a guy in the stairwell. We both looked at the camera closely and sure enough, there's a guy just standing on the landing in the stairwell in an old timey suit and bowler hat and everything. The security guard told me he'd start cleaning at the bottom of the stairs and if he saw the gentleman, he'd tell him to leave. I told him I'd come up to the landing and do the same. I didn't see him on my way to the landing. So I made my way to the stairs while calling out that the garage was closed for the night in case he was hiding. While walking through the stairwell, I startled the custodian because he was expecting to see Mr. Suit as well, but no one left the stairwell at the bottom. I told him I had to check out the rest of the grounds and that maybe he slipped out another way, even though there was no real way either of us could have missed him. I'm approaching the ramp of the next last landing on the top of the garage, and I see an older woman in an old timey dress and umbrella. She's going up the ramp in the distance and I yell at her that she shouldn't be up here and swiftly pick up the pace before I lose sight of her going to the top level. As soon as I arrived to the ramp, she was ascending, I don't see her. I got to the top of the ramp and see a kid skateboarding on the last level of the garage. I tell him the garage is closed and he shouldn't be up here, but at the same time wondering where the woman went. The skateboarder apologized and said he'd walk down with me if that would be okay. We got to the bottom and I say, hey man, you see anything weird at this garage tonight? The skateboarder looked at me with the most confusing stare and said, well, there was this older woman standing at the edge of the garage and I didn't see her come up the ramp. I screamed at her to tell her she should be careful and not get too close to the edge. I went to pick up my board and when I looked, she was gone. I ran to the edge to see if she jumped, but nothing. She was gone. She was wearing this old looking dress and an umbrella. I didn't want to tell the kid I saw the exact same woman because I was too freaked out. I suggested that it was probably a costume party and some people were messing around. I couldn't explain the disappearances though. He said he thought the same thing, but he remembers his boss telling him that years ago, 20s era people would dress up in their Sunday duds and walk through the park in town. The park was right where this parking garage was. I often go out on night walks, at least once a week. I live in Europe, so it being 3am here, I live in a city. And right as I opened the door leading onto the street, I saw a man walking on the street right beside the door. He looked me dead in the face and began going in the direction I usually go, but he kept looking back at me and slowing down. So I decided to take another route, walking fast. I was glad to see that there are many street lights on, so I powered on, listening to music, until I looked behind me and saw that he had been following me. When I walked towards people at the tram station, he switched to the other street side, but kept on following. I kind of hoped he would just go into the tram station, but he didn't. With him still following me, I walked quickly to the other entry. They were just two minutes apart and kind of hid behind a wall. I could see how he was looking around, trying to figure out where I went. When he saw me, he just kept standing and watching, leaning against something. I messaged a friend who had been sleeping 
and decided since it was only five minutes away from home, I should just return. I crossed the street and he began following me once more. His phone was at his ear, but he wasn't talking. I turned around, started walking in his direction and he said something like, Hey sweetie, where are you going? Why are you following me? You shouldn't do that, that's really creepy. He ignored this and asked where I was going. Do you wanna come with me, sweetie? No, quit following me. He kept standing there looking at me as I walked away. I know the encounter wasn't exactly horrific, but he did follow me up to my door and it really creeped me out. It's still a very early morning with patches of mist and not being a weekend, there was very little going on. We are a couple of young policemen in a patrol car on what was then considered a main road. A joke now and a joke then. It's a while back and I'm not sure of the name of the village, but we were very close. The message over the radio was simple. As I remember it, it was something along the lines of man with a gas mask in the main road. We were in the right place at the time and within seconds I saw a man jogging on the pavement to our left, rapidly pulling the gas mask from his face. Remember in the UK, we drive on the left side of the road. I also got the distinct impression he had an erection. I stopped the car and without saying a word to my rookie colleague fully opened his door and with the narrow pavement, give a very clear signal to the jogger that we wanted him to stop. The jogger obliged, a little short of the car, allowing himself to be well illuminated by the headlights. I got out of the car and approached him and could not fail to notice a distinct sparkle that did not look like a concentration of sweat or urine on the inside of his uncovered legs. I think, not surprisingly, by this time his erection had subsided. There's nothing in the handbook on how to open a discussion in a situation like this. So I said, what gives with the mask? Replying without hesitation, it gives sexual pleasure. I got on the radio to establish more details about the complaint. It didn't appear there was much substance to it as the young lady was only startled, maybe frightened as she got out of her car by a man running by her at two or three in the morning with a gas mask on his face. The next step is to establish his identity, which must have led me to look more closely at his clothing and where he was going to find some form of identity document when his shorts and shirt were made of thin plastic. I distinctly remember the shorts were black, presumably made from a large dirt bin bag and his shirt was light colored plastic, but I didn't pursue its origin in my mind. He was also wearing a classic sleeveless cricket jumper pullover, which had a name tape sewn in behind the neck. Those who went to English boarding schools will remember these name tapes. He gave me his name and address and quite speedily, this was confirmed by radio from headquarters and it was indeed an expensive suburb. Our jogger admitted to being an executive in a large multinational company. I didn't question how this adventure might go down at the next board meeting, nor with his wife if he had one. So what to do if there was no evidence of indecent exposure, no assault of any nature, which left the common law offense of breach of the peace, which I thought was stretching the evidence. I also had no desire to have this man in the back of the police car or rather to be washing the rear seat after taking him to the police station only to be given a warning by a sergeant. So I explained that the young lady could have had grounds to make a formal complaint, resulting in a charge of breach of the peace. Ah, he said, that sounds like the army conduct prejudicial to good order. I agreed and then suggested that if he wanted to dress up in this fashion, he should restrict his activities to private property, thinking his garden was quite big enough, not considering what his wife and neighbors might think. I then let him jog on. We then returned to the police station where the small assembled company wanted to know why I hadn't brought the jogger in. I asked why and the unanimous response was that they wanted to see the fashion statement. My reason was not considered valid. I'm a security guard 
a Mud graveyard shift for a federal contractor in an office building in the Washington DC area and have been at this site for about two months. The building is very secure. You need to get a key card in order to get in, as well as to move around the building. Well, today when I show up to work, the guard I'm relieving tells me that he got a prank call slash death threat over the phone. I told him to shut up and go home, that he was serious and had a report written up and everything. So the other guard tells me that he got a call around 7.20 from someone saying they were in the building in a weird scream voice. He just hung up on them, but they call back a few minutes later and do the same thing saying, come find me, I'm on the seventh floor. And that they would cut him and do all kinds of stuff in that same weird voice. Well, we have to do our hourly patrols between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. But he didn't do any of his because he was too freaked out and I don't blame him. So I asked him if he didn't mind staying a little longer to do the patrol with me. We do the whole thing pretty thoroughly and don't see anything. So he goes home. It's now 11.15 p.m. I'm sitting at the desk after completing my second patrol and am a little freaked out myself. That's when I get a phone call. Immediately I start freaking out because it's from a restricted number and the only people that really dial this number are our main office and people from the company we contract for. I pick up the phone and this strange sort of wheezing voice starts saying, what floor are you on? My hands are shaking and I'm basically freezing and don't move or say anything. After asking me the same question several more times they hang up and I call my supervisor, the building security manager and our dispatch. The weirdest part is that the person obviously has knowledge of the building because they called right when I finished my patrol asking what floor I was on and they told the other guard they were on the seventh, i.e. the top floor. Even though I know there's a high chance this is just a prank call from one of our old guards, there's still a slight chance that there's an actual insane person in the building and I have never been so scared in all my life as to when I heard that voice. That night managed to be one of the longest in my life, but it got weirder. After about six hours had passed, nothing had happened. And I started to feel pretty normal, not 100%, but not cowarding in fear either. I heard a noise at the front door of the lobby. The lobby is shaped like a triangle with a front desk and guard station at the base of the triangle and the whole right side is a big window with the front doors at the far end of that side. I instantly turn off the speakers to the computer and freeze. I don't move for about a minute and roll my chair over to the camera monitors. The display has nine camera feeds and switches to the other nine camera feeds every few seconds. So I'm frantically trying to find the ones that correspond to the front door. Now there are some employees that start showing up between five and six, but they all have key cards. So they come up from the garage through the elevator and no one has ever tried to do this during the graveyard shift. After what I felt like was an eternity, but was probably only 25 seconds. I find the feed and click on it to maximize and standing in front of the door facing towards the camera, not into the building is the figure. He's in a black suit and has a featureless face. I crap you not. My jaw drops and my heart races to the thoughts of Slenderman. I immediately call my supervisor and tell him there's someone outside the building just standing there. He says he's 10 minutes out and he'll pull up in front of the building. After an agonizing 10 minutes of staring at the feed and this guy not going anywhere, my supervisor finally calls me back and tells me to go to the front doors as he'll walk up in case anything gets crazy. Turns out the guy outside was our new guard that no one told us was coming. I didn't know if I wanted to hug the guy or punch him, but I was glad that one of the weirdest nights of my life was finally over. I don't know what compelled me to finally share this, but I have been thinking about it a lot the past few days and thought that it would fit quite well here. 
When I was about eight years old, my parents were going through a divorce. And me and my older sister used to spend a lot of our time at our grandparents' house. It's a long ranch style home on a corner of a very nice neighborhood. It's a 10 minute walk away from a gas station, grocery store, and a few fast food restaurants. The streets are long and lined with well manicured houses cradled by big, scenic California Valley Hills all around. We were never very wealthy, but my grandparents bought it as a fixer upper many years ago, and the property value had skyrocketed since then. As you can imagine, it's a very safe spot. And although there weren't many other kids in the neighborhood, it wasn't uncommon to see neighbors walking their dogs or pushing strollers down the sidewalk of our house. Although my mom was especially protective all our lives, this particular neighborhood was densely populated and my family knew just about everyone who lived there. She grew up in that neighborhood herself, so she was understandably trusting. She would once in a while let me and my sister walk to the Rotten Robbie gas station on the other side of the block to grab a snack. I would always get a ring pop and my sister would grab a three musketeer before we made our way back home. My sister was around 11 at the time and this small amount of freedom was a really big deal to us. Nothing compared to walking down that street all by ourselves in the summertime, laughing and joking around, a few dollar bills in our pocket and I felt like I owned the world. The one oddity I never noticed around the neighborhood was a small camper parked on the side of the road opposite to the gas station, right along the back side of the fence of another house. It sat there in the shade like a permanent fixture, all the windows constantly covered by opaque beige curtains. I can't explain why, but it always gave me this deep sense of foreboding when I'd pass it. I was almost positive someone was living inside it because at times I'd hear the air conditioning running as it sat stagnant at the same spot. The hairs on my neck would always stand on end as I passed it, particularly as I passed the camper door, and I'd always keep an eye on it for the fear that one day it would swing open, just as I came to pass by. I think what bothered me the most was a drawing taped to the door from the inside. It was extremely messy, a sketch of odd lines in a brown colored pencil that was frustratingly indiscernible. I could see the outline of something, a vague shape, but could never make out what it was intended to be. I never had the nerves to stop and stare long enough at it to really investigate, but each time I walked by I'd steal a glance. A year prior to the incident I'm about to describe, I was walking to my mum past the camper in the shade. We had just gone to the park nearby and unfortunately had to pass the camper before we could cross the street and continue walking. I didn't want to seem afraid, so I kept on walking right behind her and didn't object when she walked past it. This time I felt a little more brave. I was frustrated not being able to decipher the drawing for so long. And while my mum was feet away, I stopped in front of the camper door and took a moment to really look at it. Upon closer inspection, the paper was filthy. I remember doing a project in elementary school where we soaked printer paper in black coffee to make it look aged. And that's what it reminded me of. My mum walked on without noticing I'd stopped following her, but my eyes stayed fixed on the indistinct mass of dirt caked scribbles until I could make out what looked to be a tiny malformed face. My stomach turned. I immediately felt cold and disgusted as my eyes trailed over the rest of the image. I didn't know what kind of creature it was at the time, but now I can look back and say that the drawing was a badly deformed fetus inside a mass of large, perfect circles, 
like those made by a circular ring ruler. Its face was concentrated as if in pain. It was so graphically disturbing, and it seemed to portray this odd sense of suffering that stuck with me for days. As a child, I didn't know how to process it. And the mental image still makes me feel sick whenever I think about it. I'd never seen anything like it before. Adrenaline flooded my body and my chest hurt with fear. But I selfishly thought of my glorious little trip for ring pops and said absolutely nothing as I followed behind my mum. This was in retrospect, a classically terrible idea. It's one of those things you scream at main characters in movies for doing. Ever since my ill feelings towards that camper had been elevated by the drawing on the door, I thought about it every time we drove by. And about a month later, my mum once again graced us with several bucks and permission to walk down to Rotten Robbie and grab our respective snacks. I thought about telling my sister about what I'd seen on the way there, but she was older and braver and I was terrified she'd make me cross the street with her to check it out. It was a bright sunny day, and I told myself with false certainty that nothing was going to happen if I didn't acknowledge it. Maybe it would go away. We walked past the camper, and it was thankfully uneventful. On the walk back, I was feeling more comfortable and was focused on fighting open my candy wrapper while my sister walked alongside me. We passed the camper a second time, but I didn't give it half as much thought as the first. I don't remember what we were talking about, but I recall being interrupted mid sentence as my sister softly yet firmly said my name. There was a distinct fear in her voice that immediately set me on edge, like a bucket of ice water. All my senses heightened, and I became aware of everything including the sound of haphazard footsteps about 10 feet behind us. It was accompanied by a heavily rustling sound like a heavy backpack. And nervously, I turned my head to look. A man with a long unkept beard, wearing many layers of ragged clothes stood behind us, eyes unmistakably burning into the backs of us as he walked. His movements weren't normal. It was a drunken shuffle, like each of his feet were unimaginably heavy and needed to be moved one grand effort at a time. His shoulders were skewed, head tilted downwards with a strange arch of his neck. I could hear his shoes scraping the gravel with every step, but rather than seeming genuinely intoxicated, it was as if he was intentionally meandering in our direction like a zombie with the direct effort to frighten us. Behind him, I saw the camper door was wide open for the first time in all the years that we'd spent living there and realized this was its sole inhabitant. He's following us, I choked out, tears filling my eyes. My mind was spinning as I stared straight ahead, the wide street and sidewalks abnormally empty all again. My sister grabbed my hand. She squeezed it hard enough to hurt without looking my way, speaking carefully under her breath. On the count of three, we race home. She told me in a very serious tone. I couldn't reply through the growing lump in my throat, but every single cell in my body understood we had to put some distance between us and this man as quickly as possible. She began to count steadily while we walked faster. And the most terrifying part is that she started running before we even had a chance to. He must have heard her directions to me and tried to get a head start by sprinting in our direction before she got to three. But his footsteps were noisy and we bolted like deer the instant we heard him behind us. I'll never forget it. The chase felt exactly like how you imagine in your nightmares, the fear your pursuer inches away from grabbing your arm or a fistful of your hair. I pictured myself being dragged into the van with nobody around to see nor hear me. We ran so fast we didn't even have to breathe to scream. 
and peering back behind me. About 10 seconds later, I saw him running in our direction with absolutely none of the impairment he showed with those zombie-like steps just moments before. I think back on it now, and he may have been deliberately pretending to be handicapped to lower our guard, so we wouldn't start running. The thought is terrifying, but I can't rationalize it any other way. We made it to our grandparents' house, and without looking back behind us, yanked open the stubborn old door before slamming it closed, scrambling past their excited dogs to get as deep into the house as possible. I don't even think we locked it. As our main goal was getting within the line of sight of any adults as quickly as possible. My mum was talking to my grandpa at the table and gave us an amused look when we bound into the living room. Since we were the kids, running around wasn't anything out of the ordinary. And she didn't ask what happened as we collapsed on the couch and tried to catch our breath. The inside of the house felt so safe and felt in such good spirits that I didn't even want to bring up what had just happened. Like waking up from a nightmare you didn't want to talk about. I was desperate to go back to normalcy. I wanted to forget it entirely, to unwrap my candy and act like everything was completely normal for the sake of my own sanity. And that's exactly what I did. I asked my sister a few years back if she remembered this incident. I'm 25 and she's 28, and her response was strange. She remembered immediately without the need for me to prove details, but she quickly waved it off and insisted he had to have been a bored homeless man looking to spook some kids walking home with no real intent to harm anyone. I don't know. I like to believe it's some innocent misunderstanding, but like they always say about gut feelings, they're rarely wrong. I feel in my soul he wanted to hurt my sister and I that day. I never told her or anyone else about the strange drawing on the door, and I'm not sure if my sister saw the open door and connected him to the camper or not. It's one of my biggest regrets, as I would hate for any other children to have been less fortunate after innocently walking past the camper in the shade. I believe he may have chosen the spot between the park and gas station deliberately, due to the number of children walking around the area. I never saw the camper again after that day. I'm not proud of how I handled this, and would encourage anyone who finds themselves in a similar situation to contact authorities immediately for the safety of others around. I don't know if this whole story comes off as melodramatic, but it was very real and very frightening, in a way I can't ever forget. This happened a few weeks ago, in a large city on the west coast. I'm a female in my mid-twenties, and we're visiting a friend who'd been struggling recently with racism in the US and COVID isolation. Due to his aggravated anxiety, he often wasn't sleeping at night, so he took a lot of very necessary naps during the day, often three to four hours at a time. It was getting late during one of his naps, so I ordered food delivery for our dinner. With the delivery person approaching, I tried to get off the couch with him as silently as possible, put my sneakers and mask on and walked out the door. Some things to know about the apartment. A ground floor resident needs a nurse daily, so the tenants would usually crack the front gate, meaning anyone could come and go without a key. The residents were aware that people sometimes walked in off the street. In fact, someone stopped me and my dog during my first time visiting a month prior to ask who we were visiting. They apologized and said they'd had a number of people from the local tent encampments walking through the complex. At first, I thought it was racial profiling because I was pretty well dressed, clearly just showered, and the dog is always clean and adorned with overpriced collars, harnesses, and leash. But angry as I was, I understood. So back to my sneaky exit from the apartment. I closed the door quietly, like the way that you close the door when you're young and sneaking out of a house while your parents sleep. 
It was unlocked so I could get back in without waking my friend for keys. And I knew the gate was unlocked. I just went to my food pickup point on the street as I had done every other day I'd spent there. As soon as I'd finished closing the front door, I took a few steps towards the hallway stairs and locked eyes with a tall man who I didn't recognize from any of the five apartments. He was five stairs down from the next landing. We both stopped what we were doing and it felt like minutes passed as we stared at each other. Then I went through a mental checklist in my head to evaluate the situation. Just note, I also have generalized anxiety, so I'm very prone to overreacting and panic attacks. I had my phone, but nothing else to protect me. This man was significantly taller than I, which doesn't happen often because I'm nearly six foot and he seemed to have been interrupted in the middle of something. Immediately, he shifted his hands when he saw me. I knew I had enough time to go back in the door because thankfully I hadn't locked it. But I also knew that it would involve me waking up my friend to tell him. We might both end up having panic attacks, rendering us both useless and adding to his already maxed out emotional capacity. Out of fear of angering this rando in the hall, I didn't want to give off the impression that I'd profiled him like I had just recently experienced, even though he was clearly out of place and I didn't want to anger a junkie trying to get his fix. Plus, coming from a city with a large homeless population, I knew how detrimentally an emergency call would be for a large, black, seemingly homeless man. So what did I decide to do? Maybe the dumbest thing I've ever done. Oh hey, almost didn't see you there, I said. The guy responds back, are you partying? He said it eagerly, but he had a sinister, or perhaps opportunistic, off-putting tone and he looked me up and down, either to undress me with his eyes or size me up. But either way was a chilling stare nonetheless. So now my heart was beating a million miles a minute, as I could recognize that he was on something. And I know enough about drugs to know that high people can be wildly unpredictable at times. At this point, I could see its hands were holding a needle, which thankfully wasn't the weapon I had in mind and I assessed that he'd probably just come to the stairwell to shoot up in privacy, which would make sense given the heightened police presence during the protests in the area. Trying to keep my cool, I respond, no, we're just having a lazy afternoon, watching TV, emphasizing the we, so he would think twice about waiting for me to return. He seemed quickly disinterested, grunted and just looked down to fiddle with his hand or clothes, at this point, I recognized that I hadn't moved from my awkward, oh crap position. So I stood a little taller and tried to make my body language convey friendly, but also don't mess with me. With all of my internal alarms ringing in my head, screaming, oh my gosh, I decided to continue down the stairs since the delivery driver was arriving. I tried to maintain conversation as I was walking down towards him and maintaining an equally unthreatening demeanor to pass him on the two by two landing to continue down the next set of stairs. I think I may have mentioned, have a good day, but was so panicked I can't remember exactly how I said it. Then with my back turned to him, I briskly walked down the 20 foot walkway to the front gate, checking to see if he was following or if I could hear footsteps, but there was nothing. So I was still panicking. I'd now left my unaware friend just 10 feet away from this man and he was sleeping behind an unlocked door. What if this stranger tried to go inside? I hadn't brought my dog along with this trip because the city was issuing mandated curfews and I didn't want to worry about taking him out to the bathroom and getting us both tear gassed or something. So I was cursing that the booming barks couldn't alert me and my friends to a possible intrusion. My friend and this guy would have been about the same weight class, but still two to four inches apart in height. And my friend would have to snap out of a dead sleep and react before this man could enter. And even if I could hear my friend react, I wouldn't have a way to get back in if the guy got inside and locked it, aside from breaking the door down. And even if I could gain access inside, how much assistance was I gonna add? I would have had to make a massive scene to alert the neighbors 
and bide us enough time while 911 responds. So now, I had eyes glued to the exterior hallway to make sure this man emerged from the stairwell while quickly turning down the street for the delivery driver. The whole time freaking out and prepared to click my lock button a million times to call emergency services. Still panicked that they might not root quick enough anyway, given the number of protests. Food arrived, I saw the man was now in the exterior walkway and changing his shirt. That seemed relieving because he would have had to have been incredibly quick with harming my friend and retreating to be getting rid of evidence already. My friend was probably safe, but now I needed to pass him up there and confirm that he was fine. He was still within the gate, so I knew I'd have to pass him again using the three foot wide walkway. And from my experience trying to watch the hallway, anyone outside would have had to have been standing at a very specific angle to see us on the street. Picture as I did, Nicole Simpson's side walkway, tall hedges on one side and the building wall on the other. So as I approach him, I could see that he was easily 6'5", even while hunched and putting on a shirt. I politely loudly say, oops, excuse me, and walk past him in silence. He stared at me for a few seconds over his left shoulder, and then over his right as I passed. As soon as I hit the stairwell, I sprinted up, and as I did, I passed his cigarette butt, hypodermic needle cap, and a half empty two litre bottle of something. I finally entered the apartment, breathing like a panicked, masked and out of shape human, and I locked the deadbolt on the door. My friend was still asleep and blissfully unaware of everything that had happened or not happened. I was relieved that my assessment of this stranger was correct. He was just someone who needed privacy from the street and any windows to shoot up. But also I was freaked out at how badly it could have gone because of the unknown variables and having made a number of decisions that could have endangered me, my friend and everyone else with an unlocked door. I sat there looking out the blinds to check that the man had left the outside walkway and thinking that I should tell my friend to text his neighbors about locking the gate. Then I thought to myself that they already knew that and my friend got visibly more anxious whenever we passed encampments of people who had been living on the sidewalk. So I decided to keep it to myself in some weird way to spare him additional anxiety. I still don't know if this was the right decision. I'm not sure how well he'd receive it now that a significant amount of time has passed. But still, let's not meet again. I used to be a supervisor for a janitorial company and a couple of times a week I had to go to a middle school and clean their hallway floors and gymnasium with a Zamboni type vehicle that mopped and scrubbed the floors. When I was there, I had the whole school to myself. I used to get finished quickly and go to the library and read while eating my dinner. But one morning after being there, I get a call from the school security. They want me to come in. When I get there, I see a police car. Uh oh, I think. They ask me a few questions. Like, did I notice anything out of the ordinary or strange while I was there last night? No, I hadn't. Usually I have headphones in. Security then shows me camera footage of someone breaking into one of the classrooms while I was riding the Zamboni not far away. I was there for another two hours. Nothing was stolen. But the worst part was they didn't have footage of the person leaving. They didn't go out the way they came in and the police had to sweep the entire school. Never did find out what happened with this one. This was back in 2014. I had moved off campus into a really nice part of town. I was in junior college, and this was my first time living on my own. Campus was only two miles away and I would often walk back home from campus. I would take the bus or catch a ride with a friend to campus. I walked home because my schedule ending never quite matched up with the bus schedule, and my friend finished two hours before my daily schedule did. I was used to walking the two miles to my apartment. I never thought anything of it because I walked right through the busy area of town along the second main road. So there were always people around. My apartment was actually a stone's throw away from the most popular frozen custard shop in the area. Every night, 
the parking lot would be packed. I'm walking home as usual, get to the frozen custard shop and notice there's a lot of people tonight. It was just something I've always noticed and paid attention to. All of a sudden a huge red truck pulls up behind me. I'm caught off guard because I have my headphones in and it takes about 30 minutes to an hour to walk home. So I'm usually just listening to music or talking on the phone. I stop to take my headphones out to look at the truck. This man is dressed like a country singer and sitting in the driver's seat. He looks at me and asks me where the mall is and I point him in the direction of it. He says, I've been down that way. I'm a photographer and I'm supposed to be doing a photo shoot at a bar behind the mall. I've lived in this town going on three years now and I know where all the bars are located. It makes it easy when they're on the same street. I explained to him there are no bars by the mall. They're all on Philly Street. And he continued to insist there is a bar behind the mall. All of a sudden he just changes. He looks at me and asks me to step back so I did. He looked me over and asked me how tall I was. I told him 5'7". He asked me, I'm doing a photo shoot. Would you like to be a model for it? I told him I don't like getting my photos taken and he insisted telling me I was beautiful and I would look great. I told him my mum and brother are photographers and have tried to get me to model for them and I don't like having my photo taken. Almost like he's given up on the tacting, he moves to another, then asks me where I live. I told him not far, but he wanted more info. I pointed in the vague vicinity of my apartment, making a point, not to an actual point at all. This dude then asks me if I want a ride. I told him, no, it's not far, I'll be fine. He kept insisting I let him give me a ride home and I kept telling him no, stepping further away from the truck. He then out of nowhere asked me how he would get to the mall. And I told him to take the road down. Go down the road, turn left, the mall will be on your left. He thanked me and began driving off and I walked slowly to my apartment. I watched his truck get to the light and instead of turning like I told him, he went straight, going straight leads into a small residential area that you need to know this town well enough to get through. I lived in that town from 2012 to 2017 and still can't figure my way through there. I made sure the truck was completely out of sight before I hightailed it to my apartment and locked the door. My dog didn't quite understand what was going on. All he knew was he had to go potty bad. I tried to distract him for five or 10 minutes to make sure the coast was clear. My heart sunk when I finally did take him out. The same red truck was parked near the parking lot behind my apartment building. The truck didn't belong there. I'm one that memorizes all the vehicles that are normal for the area and no one had a red truck like that one. I went back in and texted people describing the man and the truck to them in case something happened to me. And I did not go back out for hours. When I did, the truck was gone never saw the man nor the truck again. So to the guy who wanted to take me in front of the most popular venue in town on my way home, let's never meet. I work night shifts at a nursing home. I drink coffee all night to help keep me up. This one particular night, my coworker and I were making our usual pot of coffee and noticed we didn't have any of our creamer left. We didn't like using the creamer from the nursing home. It wouldn't dissolve, so it felt like you had paper in your mouth. I told my coworker I'd go get us some creamer from Walmart, since she couldn't leave. Her being the nurse, she had to stay in case something happened. So I head over to Walmart. I live in a pretty small town, so there's usually no one there at night, except the Walmart employees and probably two other customers. So I'm all over the aisle with the creamers and I hear two men passing by laughing and goofing off. I thought to myself, they're drunk or bored and have nothing else to do and went about my business. I head over to the chip aisle. I'm one of those people that when I go to the shop, I just have to get a snack. And again, I see the two men from earlier and I'm deciding which chips I'd like. When one of them says to me, hey, what are you doing out so late? Mind you, I'm a 20 year old Mexican girl standing at five foot one and only weigh 96 pounds. I'm a tiny girl, so I ignore them. I didn't feel like I was being messed with and didn't have any coffee yet, so I was a little grumpy. 
The guy then yells out, Can you not hear me? You know Ablo English? Arrogant, I know. I roll my eyes, grab a bag of chips and leave, and then I see them trailing behind me. But I'm on my way to the self-checkout, so I figured they were going to leave the store. Before I go to the self-checkout, I remembered I needed some more wipes for my baby. So I headed over to the other end of the store to the baby aisle and noticed the two men still following and giggling. At this point, I'm annoyed and also a little scared, so I rushed to the self-checkout. As I rang up my stuff, I noticed the two men went to sit at the benches by the doors, not buying anything, just sitting there looking at me and giggling. I'm very uncomfortable at this point and look around for a Walmart employee to walk me out to my car and make sure they didn't try anything. Luckily, the night manager was passing by just as I was getting ready to leave and I asked him if he could walk me to my car. I tried to tell him about the men, but when I looked over at the bench, they were gone. We both thought they probably just left. He walked me to my car to make sure I went home safely. I thanked him, locked my door and called my co-worker to tell her what happened. Thinking it was over, I returned to work. As I'm leaving the parking lot, I see a truck behind me. I didn't think much of it until I started making turns and they would go in the same direction. I thinking to myself, great, what if it's the guys from the store? As I reached my job, I called my co-worker and told her to have the door open for me so I can just run in. You need a code to get in and I usually need a good two tries to get it open. And tonight, I didn't have time for that. As I arrive to my job, I see my co-worker at the door. I get out of my car and run to the door. As I run, I heard a man yelling from the truck saying, Bye, mamacita. We'll see you again soon. I turned around and noticed it was the men from the store. They had followed me all the way to my job, which very much creeped me out and had been looking over my shoulder for the rest of the night. This all happened at 3 a.m. on a Thursday night. I'm not exactly sure why they followed me or what exactly they wanted, or if they were just messing with me because I ignored them. But I'd rather not find out. First off, let me say that I don't hate my mother. I don't love her, but I certainly don't hate her either. My mother is what I can best describe as a lost soul. A person with no purpose, no loyalty, no dedication or consideration for her well-being or the well-being of others. She always puts her habits and addictions before anything or anyone else. And sadly, I don't think that will ever change. During my childhood, I didn't go to school very often. In fact, I hardly ever went in. It got so bad, I really fell far behind my classmates, only catching up with my peers when I went to college something my mum just patronised me about and called me a waste of time for. She never was the most supportive or kindest of people. But anyway, on to the story. When I was around nine, my mum's habits started to get really bad. It all started when she met this man, Chris. He was stocky, just above average height, and grey hair and a grey beard, despite being only in his early 40s. Let me give you a mental image of Chris. This guy was hard spoken and always stared at me and my siblings intently, but it wasn't a kind of concern, watching of a parent guardian being vigilant. It was an icy cold piercing kind of look that petrified us and sent shivers down our spines. It seemed like he hated us, which I remember thinking was strange at the time because all I ever did was be polite and obedient in fear of what he may do. My mum started having Chris over more and more, always forcing us upstairs and out of the way. If we dared venturing downstairs for even basic essentials like food or water, we'd be thrown, and that's no exaggeration. She would take us by the arms and fling us full force back into our rooms and lock the door, which she had put a lock on from the outside for some reason. It is only now looking back at this period of my life that I realized just how messed up that actually was. She and Chris would party for days at a time, and I really do mean days. They would simply force us in our room and lock us in, 
as if it were some kind of prison. And in truth, that is what it felt like to us, a prison. We had no food, no water, we had nothing. By the time Chris had finally left, or had just passed out completely, my mother would finally release us and we would finally get to eat. Not that there was ever much to eat, but we always said at least water and potatoes is better than starving. Anything is better than dying. And yes, you did hear me correctly, potatoes. There was no bread, no milk, no cheese to have on them, not even the sliced variety. We just had these gruesome looking potatoes. Sometimes we even had to scrape off various molds and funguses growing on them. It was vile, but we had to survive. We all knew well more than hoped that one day things would be better. This would go on and on for weeks and weeks. It got so bad we actually started to hoard any food we can get our hungry hands on and stash it in our rooms. You see, our mum would occasionally go shopping. Not often, and she wouldn't get very much when she did. Well, not for us anyway. Her groceries usually consisted of beer, vodka, many packets of cigarettes, along with the usual rolling papers, tobacco and tinfoil. Make of that what you will. But the point being she would blow her benefit money intended for us on herself. And of course, on Chris. So on the rare occasion she purchased any edible items, it'd be cheap smart priced lemonade, a packet of crisps or chocolate bars and biscuits. We would be elated and cherish each bite. We wouldn't eat it all though, although we did at first. We soon learned to be smarter. And as silly as it sounds, ration it between us for the two to three days we would be locked in the room. And no, we didn't have a bathroom in there. Let's just say there were a lot of warm bottles laid around the room, and the bathroom was one busy place when we finally got out. But in truth, the less said about that, the better. She and Chris would often order out, but of course would never give us any thing that they ate. We were literally starving. Luckily for us, there was one place, Ashes, who knew of our situation. Well, I'm guessing they did, and I guess they felt sorry for us. Because one day they made us an offer we couldn't believe nor refuse. It all started when me and my two brothers snuck out while my mother was passed out and Chris wasn't around. And as embarrassing as it was, we all mutually decided that we didn't have any other choice but to ask. So I reluctantly asked the man working there if me and my brothers could please have a little food. And when we could, we promised we'd pay him back. He looked at us in disbelief and just said he's really sorry and that he wished he could. But as he only worked there, we looked back and meekly just said okay and that we understood. Looking back, we must have seemed so pathetic. So discouraged, but not at all surprised, we started to leave. As we were just about to leave, the manager called us back in after I presume hearing our conversation. He stated that every night if there was anything left, and if we were prepared to come back just before midnight when they closed, we could have whatever was left instead of it going in the trash into waste. I know this probably sounds pathetic to some of you, but to us, we couldn't believe our luck. We were just thankful and grateful to this man. As over the top as it might sound, I genuinely believe this man saved our lives. On the nights we could sneak out and go there, the manager was true to his word. Chips, sausages, samosas, whatever he had left, he gladly gave us. Even on the rare nights, there was nothing left. He would still give us each a bottle to share out of his own pocket and apologizing in the process. But in truth, he never had anything to apologize for. I don't think he even knew how much he was truly helping us. He never asked, never questioned, nor patronized us. He was kind and a good man. And I'd just like to stop the story to say wherever you are, thank you. I really am truly sorry I never got your name. Over time, my mum and Chris gradually got worse and worse, consuming more and more substances with one another in turn spending more and more. Money we really didn't have. They were both unemployed, and any money supposed to look after us, they certainly didn't use in that regard. It was at this time they both started to get even more aggressive and short-tempered, and this was when things got really scary. Chris became more physical with us and would force us and lock us in the room on my mother's command, 
or when he felt as though we had angered or disrespected him, when all we really did was play or speak too loudly in his eyes. This continued on and on for some time until eventually things escalated dramatically. My mum and Chris started to fight more, but not just fight. They would scream, throw things, and it honestly sounded like a war zone down there. But thanks to the awful place we lived in and the horrible individuals who inhabited it, the police were never called. If I'm honest with myself, even if they were, I don't believe they would have or could have done anything. My mom was as bad as she could be, but I doubt she would have cooperated with the authorities, even though Chris had physically harmed her several times. However, she did eventually stop seeing him so much. It was gradual, but eventually Chris had stopped showing up altogether. Me and my brothers were delighted. We truly believed this could be a turning point, a fresh start. But how foolish were we? My mom went off the rails. She began spending all day and night partying in many different places with different men all night, and then she'd end up sleeping all day. She blew through money even faster now and eventually got into debt. As you can imagine, we began to be locked back in the room more and more. It got to the point we eventually snapped and had enough. We all kicked and kicked and eventually kicked the door open and kicked the lock clean off. There was a moment of tense silence as we hoped that she and her, shall we say, guest for the evening didn't hear us. And to our absolute relief, they didn't. Or at least they didn't care enough to check. We decided that we would just stay in our rooms, but at least now we could use the bathroom and drink from the tap. It still really sucked, but for us it was just nice not to be confined to the room anymore. Fast forward a few weeks and Chris is back. He's round again, and we all knew it was only because he was lending her money to pay off her debts and enable her to use again. But as kids, we could do nothing, only sigh and feel trapped. The partying, the long stints in our room, it was all to our dismay. But unfortunately, or fortunately depending on how you look at it, this time it was only short lived. With the constant partying came the constant arguments. It got really bad again to the point my mom told Chris to leave, and after some kicking, scratching and screaming along with several broken items, including the old box television and the microwave, he eventually did. But not before vowing to return to collect his money, and that she better have it or her kids, us, would regret it. An empty threat, right? Wrong. A few days went by without incident. But then one morning, a Saturday as I recall, my mother received a call. It was Chris. He demanded his money back and that he was coming over. She screamed at him that she didn't have it, but he told her in a sharp, loud tone she better get it or else. Thankfully, my mum puts her phone on speaker so we're all terrified, but at least we knew what was happening. I just remember my mum pausing for a minute and then softly said, okay, Chris, fine. Come over. Callum will give it to you. And upon hearing this, my blood ran cold. I didn't have his money. I didn't have any money. Not a penny. What could I do? She then abruptly hung up. She crouched down slightly to be eye level with me and in a matter of fact simply told me that Chris is coming over and as he had a key, he'd let himself in. Just please tell him I didn't have his money. But I was ironing earlier and as it was hot, decided to iron in the garden, and I had the money on the ironing board to keep it safe. But a big gust of wind came and blew it away. I tried to chase it, but I couldn't find any of it, and so that we're sorry. So please just tell him that, is what she asked me. And then, she left. She left us all alone with an angry addict coming over. An angry addict who wanted his money, and wanted it right now and all that she had left to defend us with was this tall tale. This lie so absurd and poorly constructed me and my brothers couldn't even believe it. Several minutes went by and me and my brothers just huddled in the front room not knowing what to do. We were so terrified, it honestly felt like time stood still. It felt as if we were just standing there waiting for something to happen for hours, but truthfully it couldn't have been more than 10 minutes. Suddenly the front door flung open forcefully and we all instantly knew it was Chris. He barged into the room and demanded to know where our mother was hiding and where his money was. This guy was terrifying, big, angry, and he honestly looked wild. 
He was sweating profusely, his eyes wide, and he looked furious. He truly looked insane, like he wanted to hurt us. My brothers and I just stood there, frozen in fear. I looked at them, and in my role as their big brother, even though I was just as scared and just as powerless, I knew I had to speak up. I had to do something or at least try. So I told him that she wasn't here and we don't know where she is. He just scoffed and said, typical, hiding things as usual. That's what your mother is, a coward, a coward and a thief. We didn't answer and he didn't like that. He walked closer to us and got into my face and said, forget your mum, where's my money? His breath was rotten and up close, I could see how red and bloodshot his eyes were. He looked possessed. His eyes were a mixture of dilated pupil and bloody eyes. They looked demonic. His eyes only shook me further and as a result, I struggled to answer. I, I don't know. I finally managed to blurt out. None of us do. He snarled, called me a liar, and demanded that I tell him, and that my mum better have his money, so I better talk now, or else. I really don't. I honestly, I begged him. I just wanted him to leave. I just wanted me and my brothers to be safe, but of course he didn't believe me. He inched closer to me and spat in my face. I was at the brink of tears at this point and my brothers just looked in horror, frozen in place, tears forming in their eyes. I really don't know. My mum said she lost it while ironing in the wind, I replied. Stupid I know, but I was scared and desperate. And at the same time, it's all my mouth could form. He really didn't like that. He grabbed me by the shirt and lifted me off the ground. Do you think that's funny? Am I joking to you? He screeched into my face. I couldn't. I couldn't even bring myself to answer nor look at him. I was just so scared. I just wanted this to be a bad dream and for it all to be over. I wanted him to go away and leave us alone. Look at me. Am I joking? He screamed. No, I'm sorry. I don't know where the money is. I don't know where my mum is. I don't know anything. Please just let me go. No, but mark my words. If I don't get my money, I'll be back. And I'll end you, I'll end your brothers, I'll end your mum. I'll end you, all of me and my kids will dance on your grave. And with that he left. No violence, no termination, just three terrified kids. I know to other stories this might seem relatively tame, but it shook me to my very core. It traumatized me for quite some time to be honest. My mum would return home some days later without explanation or even the smallest hint of interest or concern as to what transpired while she was away. All that despite the fact she had in my eyes and my brothers left us for dead. That may be dramatic, but she left these young children to defend off a clearly very unstable addict and for that I cannot forgive her. Me and my brothers went to live with my aunt after this and thankfully we began to see her less and less. She actually ended up getting back with Chris. I know, typical, right? You can believe that. So that whole terrifying ordeal ended up being for absolutely nothing. Thanks, mum. So although I don't hate you, please, mum and Chris, let's never, ever meet again. When I was about 12, I was at the mall with my parents during the holidays, shopping. I had gotten a walkie-talkie set and was really stoked on them. And for some reason, I brought it to the mall with us. My parents were doing some Christmas shopping in a big box sports goods store, and I was bored out my mind. So I asked if I could wander around the mall and could use the walkie-talkies to let them know when they were ready to go. This was over a decade ago. So I don't remember what led up to this or why I announced my presence was listening to various channels. Nor do I remember exactly how the conversation went, but it was something like this. A male with a distinctly creepy sounding voice asked me where I was. I stupidly told him I was at the mall, even though alarm bells were going off in my head. He kept trying to get me to tell him where in the mall and that I should come to a certain section. 
After a minute of this interaction, I finally had the sense to cease communication and nope out of there fast, back to the boring sports store to the safety of my parents. I told my parents, but since there wasn't any way to identify the man, or what his intentions were, nothing could be done about it. I think it's scary to think about, and I'm glad nothing happened. I hope to God that man never managed to take, or get anyone to come to him, ever. I work at Subway. You know, sandwiches and stuff. So everyone at our store, aside from my manager and the regional manager, believe the store is haunted. During the day, everything is fine 99% of the time. Whatever is there likes to wait until night shift, specifically 8 till 11 p.m. And the entity also waits until you're separated from your co-workers or alone entirely. The only known time it's been active during the day is one time when the assistant manager was alone in the store and panning up bread on a holiday so it would be unswathed for the next day. He said all was well until towards the end. All of our closed store alerts were going off. The online order noise, drive through headset beeping, toaster proofing oven, everything. And on top of that, the radio suddenly blasted on full volume. He finished the bread a bit hastily and left. Another night, my co-worker was making her way out of the store when she was grabbing her car keys. Her store clock yeeted itself off the wall and shattered. She cleaned up the glass and left. We still haven't gotten a new clock. The old assistant manager would sometimes stay extra late, off the clock of course, and mooch off the Wi-Fi to do homework. He said he always heard footsteps shuffling and equipment moving around in the back. And my one only experience isn't very special. It was after closing, doors locked, and my coworker was cleaning the bathrooms and I was finishing the dishes. I was putting away a few on a high shelf and heard someone clear their throat behind me. It scared the crap out of me and I ended up dropping the bowls. I turned around and said, screw you before I could comprehend there was no one really to say it to. The rest of the night I was hella uncomfortable. That is kind of it. I still work there, don't do nights much anymore. Not by choice anyway. This happened about three years ago. I was 12 at the time and I live in quite a large town. However, my house was relatively close to the center and it was roughly a five minute walk. I had ordered a book at the local bookshop and was going to collect it. Despite being quite young, my parents were fine with me going by myself and quite often asked me to run some errands for them. However, this time it was just an in and out trip. My town is relatively quiet for its size and is mainly full of elderly people. Plus, the clothing I was wearing was not very suggestive. It was jeans and a shirt with long sleeves and it was cropped slightly. I had a handbag and was wearing headphones and was in no way looking to spark conversation. However, on my way back home, this scrappy looking guy who looked like he was in his late teens slash early twenties approached me. Keep in mind, my social skills are awful. I get freaked out if someone offers me samples in town so the fact this dude was starting to make conversation with me triggered something in my brain to avoid the conversation at all costs. I pretended I didn't see him and walked past, but he continued to follow me and ponder questions. I turned my music down to hear what he was saying, but still pretended to ignore him and he ended up asking me if I wanted to see his van. I snapped and turned to him asking if he was stupid then carried on walking. He kept following, so I built up my confidence to ask a couple having coffee to get rid of the guy for me. When he saw I was talking to people and they were pointing at him, he walked away. I thought that was the end of it, but I took a slightly longer route home just in case. As luck would have it, I walked down a long stretch of road and saw him at the very end, wandering around a small green. I suppose he saw me too and he turned and started advancing towards me. I picked up the pace and sprinted to the gas station. 
run by this lovely dude who me and my older sister have had many run-ins with. And when I got there, I told the guy everything that happened and he gave me the phone to try and call my dad. There was only a short way between the gas station and my house, but I was terrified going out. My dad answered the phone and I started telling him what happened and that's when something broke out. I burst into tears, which slightly took me by surprise as I was not an easy crier. A little while later, my dad came and collected me and the shopkeeper told him what happened. We went home, my dad called the police and we later found the guy wandering around said gas station. I hate to think what would have happened if anything had happened differently and I hope to never see him again. La Diablesse or La Hablesse is a character from Caribbean folklore. It's a human woman, usually having an attractive body and clothing, but with a hideous face, which she keeps hidden. She has one human foot and one cow hoof. She lures males into the forest so they can get lost and never find their way back. And they end up dying or being eaten by wild animals or perhaps meet some other gruesome fate. The following story happened in Trinidad in the 80s. My uncle was living in the house I live in presently. It's my grandfather's house that my mother inherited. In those days, it was my grandparents and their eight children. My uncle was one of the older siblings and would work late night shifts and would return home between the hours of 11 p.m. to 1 p.m. Now my street then wasn't as developed as it is now. There was a lot of bush and forested areas with a few houses scattered in between. My house is about a quarter of a mile in the road and wasn't paved at the time and more of a track than a road. One night when my uncle returned home from one of his night shifts, he saw in the distance a woman walking down the street. From the look of her clothing, he assumed it was my senile great grandmother she had had a few instances where she would wander off and reach far places. So initially my uncle thought it was her. He saw her familiar dress and the white shawl she always had draped over her head. And he could make out pieces of tattoo she had on her arm. Now, he thought it was strange. It was the latest he ever saw her outside and her house was at least 10 minutes walk from ours. He called out to her a few times, but she didn't turn. She just kept walking. At the time, my uncle decided to follow her and get her back home. As he neared her, he realized something really weird. He kept calling out to her and yet she didn't turn around. When he looked down, he saw that my great grandmother had a cow hoof where her left foot should have been. He was really close to her now. And when he noticed it, the woman stopped dead in her tracks. My uncle in sheer terror turned around and said he'd never run so fast in his entire life. He raced on home and since that incident, he's always had my grandfather wait up for him until he eventually left that job. This happened a good 20 plus years ago and I had forgotten about it until today. I think it's a good reminder that sometimes the most unexpected things can happen when you least expect it. This event really made me feel like I couldn't be safe anywhere and caused me to be hyper vigilant every time I left my house. And that feeling stayed with me for a long time afterwards. It was winter time about 11 in the morning and I was standing at a bus stop. This bus was in a mini mall where there was a bigger department store, a dollar store and another little shop. I was going to catch the bus to my brand new job. And that day was going to be my very first day at the new shop. So I was excited and nervous and definitely wanted to make a good impression. While I waited for the bus, I realized I was a good 15 minutes early and also had forgotten my gloves and it was bitterly cold. My hands were freezing, but I only had a few dollars on me. So I figured it would be cheapest to buy new gloves at the dollar store. When I went in, it was quite big, but there were no other people in there yet besides the older Asian man behind the front counter. He gave me a big smile and came around the corner to stand next to me. I asked him where the gloves were located and he said, I'll show you. As soon as he said this, he laughingly grabs my left hand with his right one and starts 
bringing it towards the back of the store. The back of the store had a display table with some things on it, toys I think, and on the wall behind it was a section with winter items, and just to the right of that, a door that said employees only. Everything happened really fast. When he grabbed my hand and started bringing me towards the back, I kind of awkwardly laughed because he was laughing, and I just thought he was an overly friendly guy who was trying to be helpful. I had also been in this store a few times before, and both times the same guy was there, but he was ringing people up and he was always happy and smiley and laughing, with every customer who he interacted with. I never got any weird vibes from him or any other time I was there. So just as we got to the back, out of nowhere, the hand holding mine clamps around my wrist really hard. His other hand reaches over and grabs my chest ridiculously hard, twists it, and starts pushing me towards the employee-only door. I could not believe how fast everything changed. I'm so happy I had worn my thick boots that day, because the only thing I could do was kick him in the shin and try to pull away from him. We went back and forth, with me trying to get away from him, while he tried to get a hold of my arm tighter, and while also trying to push me towards the door, while I'm still trying to land kicks. All in this, he lost his balance and fell into the display table, and then I was able to get my arm away, and I just took off running as fast as I could. I ran to the back of the next store, and they had a customer service department, where there were other people, and there were phones. So to try and wrap this up, I used the store's phone to call my mum because I didn't know why. I was so confused and wondered if I should call the cops. I was trying to figure out what just happened while also realising that I missed the bus and was going to mess up the first day of my new job. Well, I did call the cops, though after I got off the phone with my mum who came to get me. The way I looked at it was like, okay, I was already alright, but what if I hadn't gotten lucky? What if this guy does something to someone else and they don't get away? What if something even worse could happen to someone else or already did? This happened in broad daylight on a weekday morning, so it could happen to anyone. They arrested him and we had to go down to the station to give a statement. About a week later, there's an article in the newspaper that they've arrested five people that own the dollar store because they had apparently been setting up these dollar stores for a few weeks as a front for some shady activity and then they would close it down, wait a month or two, and go to a different county to open another one. Like I said in the beginning of this, this messed with me for quite a while after that. I don't feel safe when I leave my house. I just wanted to buy a pair of gloves. So creep from the dollar store, let's never meet again. This happened to me over 10 years ago. It's been a long time on my mind. I was never a believer in the paranormal. My parents raised me atheist. My mum especially was a very no-nonsense kind of woman. Didn't believe in religion. Didn't believe in anything. And that's the way me and my family all viewed the world. That is, of course, until the following events transpired and my worldview started to change. So as I said earlier, I used to work at a historic hotel. It had been around for over 150 years as far as I knew. The building in some form or another was a hotel. Obviously it had undergone changes, plenty of them, and was a lot bigger than the grounds it originally stood on. As it had been so successful, it actually consumed much of the surrounding buildings. The hotel itself was quite nice adorned in the Roaring Twenties style. Even the staff were made to wear old-timey clothes, all to add to the authenticity. As contracted night security from a different company, we didn't have to undergo such privileges in regards to our garments. Now the hotel itself was not that tall, but quite lengthy. It had loads of different rooms and corridors and the like most of which we could observe via our cameras, and a small section of passages in the basement that were mostly used for housekeeping and laundry and stuff. Anyway, I had been working there a few weeks when I overhear a few of the night watchmen having a chat. I had arrived 
a few minutes early before I would be relieving them and I would be doing the graveyard shift. I start getting chatting with them. I hadn't really spoken to them much before and figured it'd be nice to make friends at the job. One of them, Darren, was telling a story about something he'd experienced a number of years ago. He's the kind of guy who, when he got his first job, stuck by it till the bitter end. I think he must have been working here at least 40 years or something, and he looked like he was on the cusp of retirement. I spoke to him for a while, just before my shift started, asking him what it was like to work in the same place for so long. He explained how he enjoyed seeing the hotel change and undergo its renovations, how he'd seen many interesting people come and go, but one thing that stayed consistent were the spooky happenings in the hotel. He said it in a kind of comical way, so I wasn't sure if he was joking or not. He gave a little laugh and said he'd tell me later. I was working with another girl on the night shift. She was quite nice. And at some point in our infinite boredom, did we start chatting to each other about the supernatural. She brought it up. And I was curious, more from an interest point of view rather than belief, some of the stuff that had gone on around the hotel. She had been working there a few years now, and it seemed common knowledge that there was something afoot in the hotel that most people couldn't explain away. She said that she wasn't sure how many spectres were populating the hotel, but she had heard a few stories especially one that resonated with her from a disgruntled guest. She had been the person who had actually checked the guest out. She went on to tell the following story. It was a night much like this one, boring with not much to do. I was just sitting here at the desk when suddenly I hear the elevators ding and out comes a woman running, holding her young son in her hand towards the front desk. She slams the key on the counter and says she wants to check out and needs a taxi now. I, in a flurry, ask her what's wrong and why she's choosing to leave at 3 a.m. Does she want to go to the airport? She'd never given me an indication when I checked her in earlier that day. She goes all pink, looks me dead in the eye and says, girl, there's a ghost in your hotel and I'm not staying here a minute longer. Get me a taxi to some other hotel, please. I can't deal with this. She calms down after a few minutes. As you can imagine, a 3 a.m. taxi isn't always gonna arrive very quickly. I offer her some tea and biscuits, and after she and her tired son, who by this point had fallen asleep on one of the chairs, accepts, she goes on to tell me what exactly happened. She said she felt like she was being watched since the moment she got into the room. She said the room itself was fine, but there was just an uncomfortable dread, an eeriness seeping into her from just being inside. She tried to play it off as long as she could, but she woke up in the middle of the night to pee. Just as she was getting up to go, did she see something from the corner of her eye? but in her groggy state, just assumed it was nothing. She went into the bathroom and, as an important detail, said she didn't close the door and let the light trickle into the room. As the bathroom is in a sort of mini passageway before you enter the room itself, there wasn't that much light pollution that could have awoken her son, she explained, and she was scared that by closing the door and opening it again, there was more chance of that waking up her son than the light itself. I'm not sure why she added that, but she did. She then went on to say that just as she was getting up and about to wash her hands, did she see the shadow, what she assumed she saw a moment ago, now by the rim of the light. Trying to not feed too much into it, did she turn? She said at that point the shadow moved. It made her jump because it darted straight towards her. She wasn't sure if it disappeared before it reached her or if it went right through her, but she turned around and there was no shadow in the room. 
At this point, she was wide awake, freaked the hell out, got her son, threw their stuff in the suitcase, put on some jeans and a jumper, and jumped straight out. I checked the room after they were gone, and couldn't find any remnants of anything spooky. That was just one story she shared with me that night. Another one that I found particularly interesting was one that was later corroborated by Darren, although Darren's was far more complete, so I'll tell his version, as it happened to a guy he worked with who has long since retired. This guy was working night security. An important detail is that this hotel has a roof. No one really uses it. It's got gravel on there, and I think some of the night guards when patrolling go up there just to have a smoke. So this guard goes upstairs midway through his rounds and has a smoke, just staring into the sea of lights in the city. That's when he hears a crunching from behind him. Assuming it's one of his colleagues, he doesn't even turn around, but instinctively offers them a smoke, waiting for the crunching to get closer and for them to reach him just as he's looking out. He ponders as all the noises stopped. So he asks again, but still doesn't turn around. So you're going to come for the smoke? A voice from behind goes, yeah, in one of the deepest voices possible. For a moment, he just stands there, pondering who this voice is. As far as he's aware, no one with this voice is even working here tonight. Not that he can recognize whose it is. In his curiosity and confusion, he turns around as he hears a crunch midway on the roof. He looks but sees no one. But the sound of the crunching of gravel is ever approaching towards his location. He's quite close to the edge at this point. He's maybe a few feet just looking out onto a sheer drop. As the gravel approaches, he just about craps his pants because there's no one around that he can see anyway and boots it to the door. He closes the door behind him, runs all the way down the stairs, and makes it to the front desk. The guy openly admitted to wetting himself on the way down. He was absolutely terrified. He called in sick the following week, and reluctantly came back to work, but apparently never went up to smoke again on the roof of the hotel. The last story is one of my own. There were many other small things that happened. Guests that saw things in the middle of the night, much like the first lady. Workers who saw apparitions in hallways. People in old timey clothes who would walk into the elevator. And when they'd reach the elevator themselves, they'd be gone. But the one that happened to me, albeit not as scary as the others, fully convinced me that there might be something more to the paranormal than my family want me to think. I had been at work for about two hours. It must have been around midnight, and I was just sorting out some paperwork while absent-mindedly texting a friend. I had to print off some documents for personal reasons, and I'm sure that the company wouldn't mind a few pages and a dot of ink. Just as they were coming out of the printer, it jams. I swear under my breath, look into the printer, and try tugging on the page, but it rips. Annoyed, I do the thing where you have to flip the printer open to retrieve the damaged page. It was a careful, tricky business, because my tug had ripped the page in several different places, and now was trying to fish little bits of paper out from all the printer cogs that were so, so annoying. I don't know if it was just my printers, but I had always hated them. They're always slow, they never worked, and the work one, which was the best one I'd ever worked with, was now failing on me, which was super irritating. Just as the piece of paper is coming out after the second print, do I hear a voice behind me? Printer trouble, huh? Yeah, I say absentmindedly just as the page is coming out. In truth, at that moment, I felt a little bit guilty because what I was printing was for personal reasons and I hadn't been at the job long enough yet to know if people cared if you printed off a piece of paper for yourself, if it would be a big deal or not. 
So trying to kind of hide it, making out it was work related, I was just gonna be like, yeah, you know, logs and stuff. When I turn around to answer the phantom voice, but there's no one there. I look down the corridor to where front desk is, and I see that there's a girl at reception, a different one than the one I mentioned earlier. I look around, try and ignore it, put my papers in my bag, and casually walk over to the girl at reception. I ask her if she'd seen someone go into the back office, and she says no. Then I ask her who's working here tonight. She looks in the small red book in front of her and says that it was only me and her. I leave it there. I don't say anything else and go about and do my work. But that severely freaked me out. There's no way I imagined that voice. And after hearing everything that people have said and experiencing something that I truly couldn't explain for myself, am I convinced? and there might be more to the paranormal than I first thought. One night in April of last year, I was home alone and craving some chips. Fortunately, there was a gas station near my mum's house about a five minute walk away. I struggled with binge eating disorder, but I have it under control now. So my parents tried to keep junk food out of the house to prevent me from binging on it. So what I would do is wait for them to go to my brother's hockey practice or game and buy snacks from the gas station and hide the garbage in my room. As I was walking to this store, it was quite dark outside. It was roughly 8 p.m. and everything went normally. I found a bag of chips, paid for it, and started to make my way back. I live in a suburban neighborhood where the roads are generally not busy all of the time, especially at night. But to get to the gas station, I had to walk down a busy main road, so cars were a common sight at any time. When I turned onto my mum's street, as it connects to the main road, I saw a dark van with tinted windows slowly follow behind me. 30 seconds later, it pulled up, and a man rolled down the window. It was dark, and I couldn't pick out any of the man's features, but the tone of his voice made him sound like he was in his 30s. He said something along the lines of, Hey, my dog Chucky ran off and I'm looking for him. He's a golden retriever, have you seen him? No, sorry, I responded. That's all right. Say, do you want to hop in and help me look for him? It'd be a big help. I'm busy tonight, I lied. This was a very friendly neighborhood and missing pets were a common occurrence. So I saw nothing wrong with what he was saying. The only reason why I said no was because I was honestly feeling lazy and just wanted to eat chips. To me, there was nothing off or wrong about the encounter. He thanked me anyway and drove off and I got home a few seconds later, locked the door behind me and enjoyed the chips in my room. A few days later, I was telling my friend in art class about what happened, just casually bringing it up. At the time, I still saw nothing wrong until suddenly one of my friends who lives in my neighborhood, Kira, seemed to freeze up. He drove a black van? She asked. Yes, I responded. I didn't know where she was going with that. I saw him the other night. He told me the same thing about the dog, except when I said no, he opened the door and tried to grab me. That's when the realization sank in. What would have happened if I'd have agreed to help him? What would my parents do if I'd have never have come home? Kira wasn't a track team and I wasn't. What would have happened if he had tried to grab me or chase me? I was lucky he didn't. I felt sick and ended up having a bad rest of our class. To this day, I never go on walks when it's dark out alone. I'm 24, I live in Michigan, and I've been working at a small airport for the past four years. Our hangars have been around since the 60s or 70s. I've worked third shift on and off the entire time. During that time, me and some of my co-workers have all witnessed some weird stuff, but it seems like I have experienced the most of it, and I'm not sure why. Note. 
that there are three people that work third shift, two line guys and one dispatcher. We constantly hear weird noises, closing doors, footsteps, the occasional voices, and we look around and we never find anything. One night my co-worker went home early because his pregnant wife needed him. And I was sitting in a chair at around 4am taking a break watching a YouTube video. As I'm sitting there, what sounded like something extremely heavy fell and made a loud bang. It was loud enough that the dispatcher heard it from the other side of the building. My immediate thought was a jack gave out and plane fell, but nothing was knocked over or out of place. I freaked the dispatcher out so much he called the police to secure the hangar in case someone got inside. Another night, my co-worker who no longer works here, called Barry, was in the bathroom with me. When I came out and saw him go up the stairs into the office section of the hangar. So I followed him up. And when I got to the top of the stairs, I asked him what he was doing. He turned around and had a look of fear on his face. He told me he saw me go up the stairs and was following me to scare me. He said whoever it was was in the same outfit, same hairstyle and had the same hat. Everything was the same from the worn carrot coat to the Detroit Lions beanie with a stain on it and glasses. We searched the place high and low and found nothing. The only way out was past us or through the dispatch room. No one went through either. This next occurrence happened in January, right after a fresh snow on a calm night. The door to the hangar was just shaking like someone was trying to get in. We thought it wasn't latched properly, so we made sure it was secure. As we walked away, it started shaking again, but more intense. Once we got close to the door, it stopped, checking the door once again. When we got to the other side of the hangar, it happened again. We thought someone had to be messing with us, so we looked outside and found no footprints and no wheel markings of any kind. The snow wasn't all the way up to the building, so we thought someone maybe walked on that section, but it was only on one section. So if it was someone, we'd seen them walking through the snow in another section. We checked the whole perimeter of the building and through the parking lot, but found nothing. These next few things I've seen personally and no one else has seen anything similar. We have been dead since the whole COVID-19 shutdown. We shut off half the lights in the hangar now. And as I sit down on my phone, I can always see dark shapes in my peripheral. The weirdest is I can see a dark mass creep out from under the toolbox. It's the size of a softball, but it was extremely dark. It moves slowly creeping towards me. And if anyone makes a movement where I look back at it, it shoots back underneath. Another thing is I walked past our break room and saw someone sitting in a chair with their boots up on the picnic table bench. I could make out warm brown boots and blue jeans, but it was only the bottom half. I turned the light on and there was nothing. After seeing those two things, I experienced sleep paralysis for the first time ever. I woke up and just saw a dark black figure standing in my doorway. It was clear because it happened around three in the afternoon. This last thing happened two days ago. Me and my coworker Terry were sitting down and a five foot piece of quarter inch wall trim was knocked off a shelf and landed 10 feet away from it. We know where it fell because we cleaned up and Terry put it on the shelf and it wasn't hanging off or anything. It was a solid six inches off the ledge. I honestly don't know what to think of this stuff. And there has to be a reasonable explanation for all of this. I just feel like I need to get all this off my chest, but felt like people would think I'm crazy or lying. But I know this is real. 2012 had a rocky start for me to say the least. And had I have known at the time that I was going to be using my Junker Project car to save my life from someone I had hardly known, but who had also been in my life for almost 13 years, I might have spent less time worrying about reading and about working on 3D art and more time out working on the car or my own fitness. 
I, however, felt that having finished high school single and spent the following five years on failed dates, maybe once a year, that there was absolutely no reason to think anyone would want me around or to bother me as I was a monster, just under 280 pounds. Rob and I had become acquainted through school as far back as elementary school, but I had never really got to know him, often helping him out with bullies and such simply because I couldn't stand watching. I wasn't very popular, pretty much everyone including the outcasts left me alone. Even Rob did till late middle school, and it wasn't hard to see why. I always looked like I was ready to end someone, and when I wasn't, it usually meant I had fallen asleep in class. After graduation, as far as I was concerned, everyone moved on with their lives and grew up. You know, got jobs or died young partying as words came up from time to time through social media. Rob's parents had apparently moved to Australia for three years and left Rob with the house. His uncle moved in to help with the upkeep on bills and such. Rob himself had developed schizophrenia at some point shortly after graduation, and this was brought to light by the passing of his grandfather. I wish someone had been around to tell me of any of the above before he tried to drag me to hell with him. I would run into him from time to time at the mall or Walmart or GameStop, just regular places that didn't seem odd at all for me to be talking to him. It was somewhat of a break from my fairly boring life. This was the way of a small town. Rob had become a big guy, well balanced in weight and height compared to the majority of our school years. His self-esteem was still shot, and he would always ask if I wanted to go drinking, but as conversations went on would also ask if he could help me out with anything. He always asked these two things if we talked, no matter how short the conversation was. I always declined. At first I thought he had outwardly started acting bi or gay, or had taken a liking to me so I avoided him wherever I could. I was bad at getting a date, and I'm straight, so turning down a guy wasn't exactly in my mindset anyway. Spring of 2012, I went to a car meet to show off my new prize. Rob was there, but something was wrong. This was two states away from home, and he didn't own a vehicle yet. Looking back, it just seems odd. I knew this was off and got that gut feeling that told me trouble was brewing. He didn't approach me, though he did watch, giving glances on occasion from where he stood. Before the meet ended, I decided I'd say hello, at least to be polite and see what he was up to. In a voice that was almost as if his mind had been somewhere else altogether, he said, that was messed up, you know, and it's not gonna be the last mistake either, I bet. My head fell to my right shoulder and my eye face was again locked in confusion. What? I said hello. Hello, he mimicked in the same voice again. I turned away and brushed it off as him being childish. Maybe someone had already pissed him off and he was just venting. Ah oh, well, not my problem. The meat ends and I'm easily the third or fourth to get out. Rod had been sitting in the passenger of some Dodge Charger and looked to be now watching the owner, waiting tiredly to be taken home. Skip ahead a few weeks for another meet. I show up late after getting off work late, and I'm gonna see a restored Ford Falcon that this guy on the forums I've joined have been posting pictures of. There's a small standing around the car. That's not the owner, it's Rob. And he's looking dead on me as I walk up. He waits till I'm walking by him around the front of the car and lightly open-handedly pushes my shoulder to get me to look at him. And the second I do that, using the mock voice from last time comes up again with the words, mistakes, mistakes. I'm losing my nerves because the voice doesn't sound to be a threat. But when I ask him what his deal is, like, it's like I suddenly stop existing again. There's a guy next to me now, Travis. I know him because of his truck. You can't miss the paint job. He's out of his head. Just ignore him. It's not the first strange thing he said tonight. Travis seems to have caught the look on my face, and I guess is trying to help. The evening ends. Everyone leaves but me. I stick around to enjoy the night sky and cool breeze. 
I'm in an empty lot on a mountainside for at least another 40 minutes before I finally go. There's the Falcon about 20 or so miles back down the road, between town. It's sitting on the shoulder, blinkers on, and Rob and the owner both leaned on the car looking entirely bummed out. It ran out of gas, and they've both just finished arguing about whose fault that is. I offer to give them a lift to go get gas. The owner instead hands me a canister from the truck and some money, insisting that they'll both need to watch the car. No chances I'm letting anything happen to it. As I leave, I hear them get on each other's case, and could almost swear for the first time I've actually heard legit anger in the otherwise depressed, normal voice of Rob. I return to them. The owner is sitting in the driver's seat in a half. Rob quickly nabs the canister from me and waves me off, almost in a disgusted fashion. Maybe I should have taken the hint that Rob's mocking and such were a mental issue, but for whatever reason I kept thinking it's just some misplaced anger. Guys, you sure you won't need any more help? The owner starts to speak up, but it's cut off when Rob whirls on his heels from filling the tank, and in a rage-filled scream goes, Always be helpful, but never when needed. Always a mistake. We don't need you. I'm not about to fight with him or let him get any closer to me. Fighting Rob would be about the dumbest thing I could do. I was out of shape, and he on the other hand was big, but not muscular, but tough enough to take me out without a second thought. I wouldn't go to another car meet for a month. However, it'd be far from the last time I saw Rob. These next two visits would leave me helping him to get home and others running away from him with a dislocated shoulder. I had been out in town getting some supplies to build a new desk for my home office. On the way home, I'd come across a gold Corolla sitting half on the road, half off, front end blown apart by an impact with a deer and never too far from predictable with my luck. It's Rob. He was down and clearly had been crying, sitting in the front of his now totaled car, holding his keys, mumbling about how badly his luck was. I didn't recognize him at first, and when he saw it was me who had pulled up beside the car, his face turned from sad to broken joy, clearly still broken but relieved. As he walked up to my window, the tow truck he called showed up. He sternly asked for a lift home after he directed me there, and I dropped him off. The ride was silent other than directions, and he got out with a painful sign said thanks, and went into a house where no lights were even turned on, and I left. I had rented a small car garage to work in to be away from home so my family couldn't distract me from my work, so I could study my car as I was using it for reference to get a 3D model I was making. It had been two months since I'd last seen Rob or gone to a car meet, and Summer was having a lift of heat waves, so instead of sitting at the computer, I was under a car doing minor repairs like a brake job. The only people who should have any idea of where I was or what I was doing should be my parents and the shop owner Tom. However, when a hand gripped around my forearm and yanked me out from under the car, where I had been trying to see to undoing a caliper bolt, the last person I ever expected to see was Rob. It's always your fault, he said loudly and angrily to my face as I tried to jerk free and get to my feet. In a moment, getting to my feet would be the least of my worries. Rob had holstered me up to my feet and raised a clenched fist. They always tell me it's your fault. He swung his right fist, his left hand firmly grasped my forehead. Seeing his fist already as he swung, I jumped, and it did little to help the full blow as it went straight to my kneecap, and the force from me jumping caused him to stumble, sending both of us to the ground. I attempted to kick up to my feet once more, but my right arm was now bent in his grip from where he had fallen. Bad idea. I got up already, but my force against his grip not only forced me back down, but had dislocated my shoulder. Pain. Pain was now screaming its way through my entire right arm, and I yelled out, which caused him to let go. He kicked me in the back as he got to his feet and reached for the nearby jack, swinging it to the ground at me as I rolled clean under the car to the other side, getting to my feet. You're not. I can't. No, you'll make more mistakes, more trouble. Stop. Stop. He yelled and rushed around to the other side of the car, blocking my attempt to run out to the open bay door. Rob had the wrench I was using in his hands now, 
and was just standing there, enraged, glaring me down. I wasn't some pro fighter, but I wasn't going to waste time being chased around the car either. No more thinking. I ran at him and jumped, tossing all of me into him. Being overweight paid off, with its one and only benefit. My weight knocked him down and sent me tumbling over towards the bay door. I got up, busted out the door in a sprint as the wrench flew by me, crashing against the asphalt, and I heard Rob yelling and running after me, but he tripped and I glanced only for a moment and made my way to the project slash junker car. I got in, turned the key, and it turned over. Rob had gotten up and was coming at me, bending to grab the wrench again as he did. I turned the wheel hard and floored it, and I hit him at waist level and slammed on the brakes, watching him bash against the hood and fall back onto the pavement, this time staying down, groveling in pain. Kicking the door open to make room, I frantically started to reach for my phone in my right pocket with my left arm to call the cops, and to the best of my ability, started running towards the owner's home. The yelling had caught Tom's attention, and he had seen everything that happened outside the garage. He was already on the phone with the police and after reaching me, stayed between Rob and me. After a hospital visit and a very fun session of let the interns do it, the police stopped by and informed me that with Tom's statement and my injuries, it was clear what had happened. They also went on to tell me that Rob had recently been suspected of trying to attack another person and had in fact beaten the Ford Falcon's owner the night I saw them. I have not seen Rob since then, and to the best of my knowledge, he is currently being held in a mental institution somewhere in Pennsylvania, close to the family he left here in the US. I don't think there's some lesson I can give or an explanation outside his mental health condition. All I would like to say at the end of this, fight no matter what. Even if it seems hopeless, just fight. I'll start this off by stating that at the time of this incident, I was 10. This was about 30 years ago. And I've only explained the situation to my mum, but didn't tell her until years later. I'm ashamed of my actions because I knew better. I was in fourth grade. At this time, my parents had very little money, but were trying their best to have a roof over our heads. Even though I was a kid, I understood the financial pressures they were having, which was why I didn't ask for anything. This particular morning as I was walking to school, I was approaching a car parked across the street from the school. This car was parked with the passenger side against the curb. The front passenger side door was open all the way. And as I walked by, I was curious and looked in the car. On the passenger side floor was a lot of quarters, probably around 10 to $20 worth. A man was sitting in the driver's seat with his arm in a cast. It reminded me of Ted Bundy. He saw me looking over and called to me. Here's where I knew better, but screwed up. I walked over and he asked me to help him pick up the quarters on the floor and put them in a cup he had. He said they fell out the cup and he couldn't pick them up himself because of his arm. I thought that if I'd help, he might give me some quarters for helping. Again, I'm a kid and we're really poor and I just wanted a few quarters so I could get a soda from the vending machine at school. I helped pick up the quarters and put them in the cup. I was kneeling on the sidewalk, halfway in and halfway out of the car. I remember looking behind me and seeing mothers walking their kids to school and a few of them looked frightened for me, but kept walking, bringing their kids closer to them as they passed by. I finished picking up the quarters and the man said, my God, what a good helper you are. How about you hop in the car and I take you for some ice cream? It's seven o'clock in the morning and he wanted to take me for ice cream. Yeah, that's unlikely. He began to reach over to grab my arm to pull me in. But at that moment, a voice as clear as day told me to get up get out of the car and go to school. I knew immediately what that voice was, who it was from, and you don't hesitate when you hear its voice. You just do what it says. Yes, for me and my belief, I can say with certainty that it was God. It wasn't the only time I'd heard that voice, but I knew it was him. I understand that others don't believe and that's okay. I'm not telling the story for my beliefs, 
but it's the reason why I wasn't taken that morning. Once I heard his voice, I stood up and told the man I needed to go and ran to school. I could hear the man calling out saying he'd give me some quarters if I go back to him, but it didn't work. I obeyed the voice and went to school. Not a word or look behind. I also never walked that way to and from school again. That was the short walk to school, but I didn't want to risk it, so took the long way home after. I did hear that the man in the car was a child predator. He had apparently taken kids, and a child in particular was found by the police soon after. Thank God the child was safe and the man arrested. I realized I actually dodged a bullet there, but I was ashamed of my actions. I was greedy and placed myself in danger even though I knew I could have been taken. And who knows what could have happened to me had I not heard the voice. Me and my friend Chad and my boyfriend were hanging out at his job. He's a security guard, so we were all sitting in the booth. It's like a 10 by 10, so it's fairly small, but no one else was around. They were all inside the warehouse building because the booth is so small. It's easy to know where sounds are coming from, and there are so many options. I started hearing flute music, kind of like Elven, or like you'd hear in Lord of the Rings in the Shire. I thought it was just my friend or my boyfriend's phone games as they were playing on their phone, but mine was dead, so I knew it wasn't playing. I also thought it could have been the small radio, but the direction of the waves were coming from the left, not the right, where the radio was. I kept hearing it off and on, and then I said to everyone, what's the music? And then my friend said he heard it too. I had my boyfriend turn up his sound and it wasn't his game. My friend was playing Clash of Clans, so it wasn't his either. As we sat to listen, as soon as we really stopped paying attention to it or got distracted, I thought I could hear it again and he did too. But my boyfriend claims he couldn't hear a thing. So me and my friends start checking that the computer isn't playing. The speakers aren't on. We check the small radio and make sure the phone volumes are all the way down. We didn't hear it after maybe catching small tidbits floating back in and not being able to focus due to being distracted when we thought we heard it. It seemed to float in and out of sound instead of abruptly stopping and starting. So it was hard to notice it since it creeped in slowly, if that makes sense. I just think it's weird because it was a nice day and the music was very pleasant. I felt like I was in the middle of a forest, like a Disney character. Then I started thinking about it and realized, wait, nothing is playing that music. After I thought that, the music kept going, but once I brought it up, it sort of faded. I think it's strange that my friend and I could hear it, yet my boyfriend couldn't almost like gentle background noise. When I was in elementary school, I ran away from home. I think I was upset because my parents were giving my brothers more attention than me, which wasn't that rare to be honest. And the middle child, and while all three of us have our issues, I was considered the least challenged as my older brother has autism and my younger brother has really bad dyslexia and I was always expected to be a straight shooter. I remember packing my backpack and writing a note saying that I was leaving, leaving it on my parents' bed while they were gone, and I got about a block away when I saw my dad's truck heading towards the house. I was far enough down a side street that he didn't notice me, but a minute or two later, I saw him speeding down the same street heading from the house. I walked a ways away. I think I stopped at a church to sit for a while before I began walking again. A few minutes later, a van pulled up and a man rolled his window down. He said his dog was missing, but that he had the puppies with him and asked me to come help him look for her. I immediately saw the red flags that were drilled into me and started running in the opposite direction. My dad would sometimes do stranger danger drills with my brothers and I and one of the situations was the two of us were in the car with him and him telling my brothers and I that he had candy or something 
and asked them to come with me, and they screamed no and ran towards the house. I got to the gas station nearby and called my parents from there, and they came to collect me. And I remember seeing later on the news the picture of the man. I don't remember what his name was or what he was arrested for, but I remember how I felt when I saw his picture and my blood ran cold. I never ran away after that. It was Saturday, and everyone's out for the weekend except me. I work at a call center, and we don't get a lot of calls on weekends. One person is enough to cover an entire night shift. I'm from the Philippines and our clients are in the US. There's a 12 hour difference in the time zone, hence why we work at night. I was alone on the second floor of the building with just the janitor and the guard on the first. I was at my cubicle waiting and answering calls. At around 2am I got a call from a client, just the usual conversation of queries and concerns. As we were wrapping up the call, the client asked me, Are you home? I answered, No, I'm in the office. Why do you ask? He said, Because I can hear a lot of babies crying. I ended the call without saying goodbye and ran to the first floor shaking. The janitor asked what was wrong. I told him what happened. The janitor told me, you must be new. There are two children and one mother haunting this place. They don't harm anyone, but they do play tricks sometimes. That was that. I never did night shift alone since then. And I left the company two months later. This is the same building where my ex-colleague experienced keyboards typing on their own and where chairs make random movements and noises. I'm a 13 year old boy and I go to a sports club to practice badminton. One day after getting home from school, I got some rest and got ready to go to practice. The route I take is quite long compared to the other routes my friends take. But I enjoy cycling, so I always take the long route both on my way there and upon my return. On the way there, there's a gas station and a supermarket right besides each other. So while on my way to practice, I thought I could stop and grab a drink or something to eat. I parked my bike by the bike stand, where there are plenty of other bikes parked. I live in Copenhagen, Denmark. Almost everyone has a bike here and I head into the market. I grab my things, and when I'm done, I come back outside and see a guy who's quite tall, wearing all dark clothes. He was about six foot five, and was standing right beside my bike. He was so close he had to move before I could even get mine out. I quietly said, could you move please? In Danish, of course. And he answered with, oh, this is your bike. It's pretty nice. Yeah, thanks. I'm kind of in a rush. Excuse me. The man stared at me for a while, but then moved aside. I unlocked my bike and got out of there quickly because to be honest, I was a bit freaked out. But I've been given the talk about stranger danger many times by my parents, that it could really creep me out if there was something suspicious or something. I get to practice with my friends. I'm there for about two and a half hours. We shower and then got ready to head home. It was around 9.30 when I was done and this was late in December. So it got dark really quickly. At about four or 5 p.m. the sun would start to set. I went outside to grab my bike and beside the bike stands, there was a huge container which was being used because they were renovating some of their things inside the club. And even though my bike was pretty far away from it, I could see someone standing and leaning up against the container staring right at me. While I was unlocking my bike, I tried to peer harder to see who it was. That's when I noticed. It was the same dude from the supermarket. He'd followed me to the club and waited for me to come out after finishing. That really creeped me out. At this point, I was panicking. I felt the guy's intentions were not good. So I quickly unlocked my bike and began cycling fast. While cycling, 
I saw a beat up old grey car that was driving up so fast to reach me. And when it did, the windows rolled down. And it was the same creep. And he was shouting things like, Oh, don't be scared, I want to talk to you. And stuff like that, which I really didn't want to hear as I was panicking. I decided to take a route where only walkers and cyclists can use and rushed home in about five minutes. As I was entering my driveway, I couldn't see any cars drive past and was very relieved and happy that I thought I lost the guy. As I was locking the bike in the shed, I saw the exact same gray car driving up to my driveway. I was scared and paranoid that I ran for the front door and got inside and closed it. I went to our living room window where I could see who was walking up to our front door and saw the guy going up to the stairs to reach it. Seconds went by and he started trying to open the door. But as soon as he began banging on it, I called my mum since there was no one else home at the time. Unfortunately, my mum picked up on the first ring and I began stuttering and telling her what happened. She told me to get a sharp utensil from the kitchen and hide in my room and that she would call the police immediately. I went to the kitchen, did as she said, before going to my room, went to the front door and there was a window on the left he couldn't reach or else he would fall off the stairs. And I shouted that the police were on their way and that I was armed, even though I was stuttering through the whole thing. Minutes felt like hours, and I could see the blue sirens from the kitchen window. At that point, I dropped the utensil and went out through the back door to quickly get the cops and told them what happened. While talking with them, my parents came home, hugged me tight and I was crying. They searched our back garden and all over the house to see if anyone was hiding, but they couldn't locate the guy. What I think happened was that he got scared when I shouted out the window and left in a hurry, because there were visible skid marks on our driveway, which were of his car. And that's how he floored the gas to get the hell out of there. This was the first time something as scary as this has ever happened to me. And I hope no one has to go through what I did. I just hope I never meet that creep again. To set the scene, my friends, a married couple, had just bought a house in Central Oregon. The house is a little ways outside of town, set back in the woods and bordering on a national forest. It sits on almost three acres of fairly wooded land and there is a small second dwelling in the back that is essentially a one bedroom house. They were letting me rent it from them, as we had all lived together for the last year in a rental house downtown. It's early July, and I had already moved in a few weeks ahead of them because the husband was finishing an accelerated summer class. I was working from home and was the only one on the property. This was a bit before I adopted my dog, so I was really alone. All our neighbors are always off, since all the plots there are several acres minimum so the little house is fairly isolated. It's about 9.30 a.m. and my work is in full swing. I would start early in the morning and the phones were generally extremely busy at this time. Suddenly I hear a knock on my door. This freaks me out because I was supposed to be alone on the property, but I quickly push the anxiety out of my mind and figure one of my friends probably came to work on the house and needed something from me. With the way my front door is positioned in relation to the windows, I have no way of seeing who is at the door without opening it. I open the doors to see this little old lady standing there. She introduces herself as the previous owner of the house and asks if I'm the homeowner. I tell her no, that I'm renting the small unit from the homeowners, but that they should be moving in in a few weeks from now. She then asks if she could take some flowers from the garden, claiming she planted them for her dead mother. I tell her to go for it because I didn't really care and needed to get back to work. So I close the door and resume working. Later that day when I clocked out for lunch, I called my friends to tell them what happened. They seemed oddly unsettled by the whole thing and explained to me that the house had been owned by one couple since it was built and their daughter who was not the woman at the door was selling it because they had both passed away. This left me feeling a bit odd but I shrugged it off 
and tried not to overthink it. A week later, my friends are doing work in the main house, but had parked in the garage, so it didn't look like anyone was there. I was working again, as usual, when I heard what sounded like someone walking through the brush outside. I texted my friend to ask what he was doing outside the house, but he said he wasn't at the house and that they were both still in the main house. So I got up and looked through my blinds into the backyard and there's a woman rummaging through the brush. I couldn't tell what she was doing exactly as the brush is fairly high back there, but I went out later and it seemed like she had been digging. Of course, this freaked me out a bit. My car was the only one visible, so it would seem like I was alone. I immediately called my friends in the main house, who came out with their dogs to figure out what was going on. The dogs began barking as soon as they walked into the yard, because he barks at everything, but he still was out front in my house, and she was behind it. As soon as she heard the dogs, I heard her start moving hurriedly away from the house. At this point, she had to move to one of the blind spots on the side of my house, by the garage, so I could no longer watch her through the window. I heard my friend call after her, but she took off running into the woods. There have been no parked cars on the property, so she hadn't driven up. We never managed to catch up with her, as she had a pretty good head start, so I still don't know what she was doing around my house. I adopted a dog a few days later. I'd been in the process since before the initial encounter, and the dog was easily frightened by anything unexpected, so she barks and growls at any time, even when pine cones fall on the roof. Sometimes she'll even bark at nothing. Anyway, to the flower lady. Don't be creepy. Let's not meet again. The trip by foot from my school to my home used to be one hour if I took the road. 15 minutes if I took the forest path. One day, my two friends and I, who were 10 years old then, decided we'd take the forest shortcut. It had been raining recently, so there were only a few paths that weren't flooded. It looked more like a bog than a forest that day. Halfway through our walk home, we see this guy wearing a black hoodie. The hood is up, so we can't really see his face clearly. He's just standing there, looking out at us with his hands in his pockets. We start walking faster, and every so often we look back, and he's making his way around the flooded areas to follow us. Every time we look, he slows down and stops and simply stares. What's worse is that the paths available to go around the flooded areas were foreign to us, so we had no idea which direction we were going. After looking back twice and seeing the guy slowing down and staring at us, we just sprinted out of there until we got to the road. Luckily, the road we exited the forest from was a main road that we were familiar with and safely made our way back home. When I was in maybe third or fourth grade, a guy in a truck pulls up next to me as I'm walking home. I'm still relatively close to the school, so I'm surrounded by kids and parents. He says to me, your dad sent me to pick you up, which I know is bull, because my dad doesn't trust people outside the family no matter what, especially with his only daughter. So I ask him, what's my dad's name? And he goes quiet, and I can tell he's trying to figure out what to say. And I quickly say, oh, never mind, he's right there. You can say hi. Never seen someone speed off so quick. Thank God my dad taught me these things at a young age. I met this man three times, and each time it was incredibly more uncomfortable. Imagine a man in his late thirties, tall, skinny, short brown hair. I think some facial hair too. Anyway, the first time I saw him, I was there, but I wasn't his target. It happened when I went back from school later than usual, and the metro was fairly empty. The first time I saw him, he was following around this couple. They were both adults, and the guy in the couple was pretty big, thankfully, walking from one end of the metro train to the other. They were obviously trying to get away from him, 
But this guy was weird. He had crazy eyes affixed on both of them and just following them around, not saying anything, grinning. I only caught a glimpse of this, but the couple was visibly uncomfortable with this guy and he was not giving up. I remember thinking, thank God he didn't stop for me since I was alone and no one was really around aside from those two. I swear, I think I jinxed myself. The second time I saw him, I was in the subway again going to school. You know that creepy ass thing when you're holding the bar and then the person above lowers their hand on top of yours? Yeah. At first, I thought it was an accident so I lowered my hand, but he moved it again back on top of mine. I had my head down looking at my phone, I think. So when I looked up, he was right in my face, way too close to me. He was just staring at me, straight in the eye. Mind you, I'm the kind of person that will have a stare down with a stranger if they insist on staring at me, so I'm not exactly shy. But he creeped the hell out of me. It was fairly crowded, so I squeezed myself past a few people and sat down on a chair a few meters away in hopes he would just stand by the bar and leave me alone. Wrong. He sat on a chair on the row in front of me and just stared. He also had this smile on his face. Just thinking about it makes me uncomfortable. I can't exactly convey what he made me feel like, but I think it was just a lot of anxiety. It was enough to make me panic a little bit when the chair next to me was empty. Luckily enough, we were coming to a stop, so I stood up. It was a stop earlier than I'd have to get off, but I was not going to stay on the train. He promptly stood up too and started coming towards me. Because it was crowded, I pretended to get off, but instead of that, I cut through the line of people and ended up on the other side of them, away from that guy. I hid in a corner until the doors closed, and sure enough, I see him outside on the platform. It upset my stomach when I realized that he was going to follow me off the train and that I would have to stand there with him or be late to school because of it, or worse. There wasn't any security and it's not that unusual to meet creeps since I lived in the capital. So I was shaken up for a bit, but then I forgot about it. Months later, I'm on the bus with a friend of mine. I'm a girl, my hair is short. I think her hair was short as well. So in the eyes of people from my country, we both looked like lesbians. She actually is one, but that's besides the point. The bus is half empty, so there's people, but there's no seats available. We're both standing and holding the bar, talking about whatever and looking out the window in front of us. The bus stops abruptly and this guy loses balance and sort of bends over in front of us. Like, imagine he was holding the same bar we were and he was just a reverse L shape with his head in front of me and my friend's chests. That wasn't weird, like, yeah, okay, perhaps he lost his balance. But then he took a little too long to actually straighten himself up. He stayed there for about 10 to 15 seconds until we both looked at him. I stare at this guy, he looks back at me. You're really beautiful, huh? And my friend says, that's weird. Only after that did he straighten himself and look down at us. He was so much taller. He did not appreciate my friend's comment and he became a frowny man. It was our signal to move along the bus, away from him. That and the fact that he started saying stuff to us. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was along the lines of, what's your bloody problem? Can I just compliment a nice girl? It was only after when we went to the front of the bus that I finally realized that it was the same guy from the subway. If it hadn't been months, I would have suspected he had stalked me. But because it was in the same area-ish that I would get off the metro, I assumed he would just harass anyone he found. After we went to the front of the bus, he let loose. 
He started screaming at us about how we were lesbians, about how we were the devil and how we should be eradicated and that we're disgusting and that he wishes the Soviet Union would come, take over and burn people like us down. In retrospective, I really feel bad for my friend. I'm sure those comments might have gotten to her more than they did to me. I feel like the people on the bus were judging us for some reason, but I think it might have just been paranoia because of the guy making a full-blown scene. It was scary to have a man taller than us wishing death upon us. Not only that, we got off at the next stop to get away from it, and power walked our way to the place where we knew there would be some guards present. And of course, he got off and started following us, still yelling profanities at us. It was weird because as we were power walking, we didn't stare at him the entire time. We were focused on getting to the security that was ahead of us. So when we looked back to check how close he was to us, he was gone, just gone. This was a pretty big open area too. I looked around and around to see if I could spot him walking off and I just couldn't. I remember both me and my friend were shaken but again, we put it at the back of our minds and it just became a story I tell people sometimes. After that last encounter, I moved countries to go to university. I'm actually kind of glad because I felt like I would have met him again. If anyone lives in Bucharest, this happened around Piata Universitati and in the metro on the line M1 at the stop called Stefan Selmar. Since it's fairly recent. I don't doubt that he's still lurking. Stay safe, my friends. This happened to me four years ago. At the time, I was 17 years old, and I had been offered a job at a classmate's mum's mini market. Here in my country, I'm in South America for context, those are pretty common and sell everything from frozen food to bathroom necessities. Usually, people will build a tiny separate building next to their houses for it and work the store themselves. Every condo or village, these seem to mean something entirely different here. Every condo or village, which seem to mean something entirely different here, has one of these mini markets in every main street. Anyway, my classmate's mum offered me to work there, Monday to Saturday. 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. with some very good cash and free lunch. We lived about a mile away and my house was directly connected to his by a cycle path. So, I would get to use my brand new bike as a means of transportation. Basically the perfect job for a teenager. I did not enjoy working there, don't get me wrong. I actually like working and I like money, but this store had too much going on in it. So I had to make ice cream cones, bag chicken breasts, laminate ham and cheese. Again, I think those things already come laminated in most countries. I had to work the coffee machine and keep everything immaculate and in order while checking that all of the stuff this lady had on her store wasn't expired. Keep in mind, I'm talking January 2014 and I found a bag of sausages that expired on January 2013 being sold during my first week there. Overall, it wasn't really abusive. She just didn't know how to manage her store or her money. That's a completely different story though. But by the way, my ex-boss, let's not meet ever again because God, your store was so unsanitary. Anyhow, one of my many jobs there was keeping an eye on fruit and veggies, meaning checking for the rotten ones and throwing them away and refilling the tomatoes if the shelves were empty. There was only one huge problem for me. Being a five foot girl weighing only 120 pounds, the 45 pound potato sacks were an issue. For context, right in front of the store there was a huge green area and we have public workers, gardeners who take care of them. They have one specific person in charge of specific areas, so the same man would always be there doing his job. Let's call him Pete. Back when only my boss and her family worked their store, they would ask Pete for help to take the potatoes from the car and drop them at the back of the store. He would always help, 
and the only thing he asked for as payment was a cup of coffee and a sandwich. This man was in his late 50s, didn't go through education, he couldn't read and usually asked me to read the newspaper to him. And even though he didn't seem to have any kind of mental handicap, he would not understand that there were limits to how you approach people and what is and isn't appropriate. More on that later. Anyway, whenever we had to take the potatoes out of the car, my boss would phone him and he would come quickly. As he had a red bike with an engine attached to it, everyone was very comfortable with him. He was just an old man who helped with the heavier duties and asked for very little in return. As I started learning the job, my boss wouldn't be around to help me when I had doubts, meaning I was completely alone in the store. I would struggle by myself on moving the potatoes from the back of the store and often would lose a piece of a fingernail or something. Because of this, whenever she left, she would ask the gardener to keep an eye on me and help me with it. The problem began pretty quickly. I have interacted many times with people with conditions and I'm not trying to be rude, but when someone has some kind of mental health issue or syndrome, even if they can normally function and even have jobs, you can kind of tell. And I assure you, this man was completely healthy and normal. Looking back, I think he was using his lack of education as a way to shield his behavior. And so, people pitied him and felt guilt for not liking him and tried to take advantage of the girls who worked there. There had been some before me. I never met them. He would fixate on certain topics, always repeat the same conversations, become way too close to me and my co-worker, another classmate. He would stand up too close and talk some very personal problems with me. Keep in mind, he was 30 years older than me. I was underage. He became another one of the many unpleasant things that I had to deal with on a daily basis. As weeks progressed, he gave me his phone number so I could call him when I needed assistance. I never called him because I of course didn't want to be around him and because I'm the kind of person who thinks they don't need help. When he realized I wasn't calling him, he tried to push me into giving him my number. I never did it. So he would stay right in front of me in the store and come in every 20 minutes. He gave me a bicycle seat and even though I told him I didn't want it, that he could keep it. He removed my original brown seat and put the one he had got me. He would tell me he was single and owned a house. He would call me pretty and try to play with my hair, etc. I was severely uncomfortable around him, but nobody seemed to be bothered by any of those things. It made me feel very awkward and guilty for feeling these things which only contributed to the already disappointing feeling of working in this unsanitary place. I decided to do my best to ignore him, but when he realized I was distant, he started accusing me of being mean with my boss, but nothing else. It was only a summer job, so I thought I just had to stand it for a month and it would be over. But oh, no, it was not. One good day, two weeks before I had to leave, he tells me he is in love with me. Dead serious too. I was 17 and I had no experience with love and such. I had never had anyone tell me something like that. Usually, I'm a very short tempered person and snap easily and could have told him to stop messing around with me. But this just left me speechless. He had already been flirting with me for two months even though I was underage. He had given me presents. I had seen him lift two potato sacks on one shoulder and he could certainly do as he pleased with me. I started to sweat. I was feeling violated, even when he wasn't trying to approach me. But he just stared so deeply into my eyes that it was clear he was trying to make me feel inferior. I didn't know what to do and he wasn't leaving the store. My boss arrived like 10 minutes after this, so he started chatting with her. But I was left feeling violated for the rest of my shift. Two weeks later, my contract ended for the summer. I thought I would never see him again, but again. 
how wrong I was. There are green areas where I live too. One day, as I was walking my dog, I see a bright red bike with an engine attached to it next to some swings in the park. I recognize it. It was his bike. He saw me and ran towards me, crossing the street even though cars were coming. I have three dogs. One is a pit bull mix and another a husky mix. The third one is a Yorkie. And none of them liked him. You would think that my big dogs would stop him from standing so close to me, but no. And he only took a few steps back when my pit bull tried to bite his hand. I had never seen them so angry. He told me his boss had realized he was slacking on his job to help the store, and he didn't like that. So he has moved to another area away from that store. You know which area? Mine. He insisted on asking where my house was, just like he insisted on my phone number back in the day. My house was a quarter of a mile away, but I told him I lived in the opposite direction because, of course, I didn't want to tell him where I lived. That day, I told my mum about this creepy old man and all the things that he had done to that point. She yelled at me for not snapping at him or something, like she didn't understand this man could carry two sacks of potatoes at one time. I asked her not to tell my dad, because he would get so mad at me. Yep, that's the kind of parent who get mad at their kids for things that aren't even their fault. You know, they once yelled at my brother when he had his phone stolen on the bus by the guy with a knife. Irrational, I know. My mum did tell, though. The next day, my father mysteriously offered to walk the dogs. Wasn't usual for him. And the day after that, Pete wasn't around, nowhere to be seen. Mum told me later that my dad approached Pete and threatened him. Knowing my dad, he probably told him about his military background. My dad even made Pete speak to his boss about moving him to another area. My city is pretty small, so I still see him when I go on longer walks about four miles from my house. But he no longer tries to talk to me. Instead, he keeps his head down and starts moving faster to the opposite direction. Goodbye, you old creep. Let's never meet again.